Okay, so all right, everyone, welcome to today's colloquium. So let me first introduce our speaker, Professor Sub Kim from Seoul National University. So Professor Kim is a world expert in quantum field theory and string theory. He's globally renowned for his important contributions to spatiometric field theories and black hole physics in quantum gravity. So he got his PhD in physics from Seoul National University back in 2004. And the same year, he began his academic career as a research fellow at Korea Institute for Advanced Study. Then in 2007, Professor Kim joined Imperial College of London as a research fellow. Then by 2009, he returned to Seoul National University, uh, first as an assistant professor, and he's now a full professor in the same university. And throughout his career, he's made many significant contributions, especially in spatiometric gauge theories and black hole dynamics. And re regarding such his achievement, he got a uh, National Asia Award in 2016, which is a distinguished honor awarded to outstanding young scientists in the field of basic science by National Memorial Foundation. So we are very excited to have him in this APCTP colloquium series. And today he's going to tell us black holes and quantum gravity. So let's welcome Professor Kim. Uh, Professor Kim, you are muted. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, um, uh, uh, I'm, it's a great honor to have a chance to talk about uh, some topic I have been thinking of at this APCTP colloquium. Uh, I today try to talk to you some what I think are exciting and mysterious aspects of black holes and what they tell us about uh, the structures of quantum gravity and hopefully our nature. So uh, we can definitely say it's kind of golden era these days of observational black hole physics because we see black holes via various routes in the sky. But if you if you step back and think about why people, many people, experts and laymen, why they are excited and fascinated about black holes, the exotic and novel properties that makes us excited about black holes, these properties that which make people hate black holes and in 100 years ago, those factors has been there for quite a long while. I would say more than 100 years ago. <laughs> The first notable thing is the existence of the singularity in the geometry. Another exotic aspect is the existence of event horizon, a big distortion of causal structure, which is inaccessible to the observers and all the associated information puzzles. These are puzzling aspects which make them fascinating and uh, in the early days, a horrible object to physicists in early to 20th century. So uh, these objects are not just fascinating for intellectual, in the intellectual sense. But if you theoretically study these subtle aspects of black holes very carefully, they provide very important guidances to the physics of, let's say, quantum gravity, because they probe the black holes with their exotic properties, probe the fundamental aspects of our nature. So today's topic is to, roughly speaking, explain to you the exciting interplay of these two themes of black holes and quantum gravity. And the relation between the two subjects is both ways. I mean, from a few decades ago, many quantum gravity physicists like string theorists have been using their disciplines, our disciplines to explain these exotic properties of black holes from bread and butter physics. On the other hand, if you look at these exotic properties of black holes very carefully, you realize that these properties of black holes constrain and even predict some novel properties of quantum gravity physics in extreme conditions. Okay. So it guides us to better formulate the, 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 the theory of our nature. So roughly speaking, those are the subjects I'm going to explain to you partly today. So one key property, which will be the starting point of my discussion today, is uh, has to do with the existence of event horizons and the novel properties of black hole that I'd like to emphasize is that they have no hair. So in order to make black hole, you have a macroscopic amount of matter collapsed down to a very small region to form a strongly gravitating geometry. But these massive objects microscopically would have lots of detailed information about their, their dynamics. But you know, if they collapse to form black holes, if you wait for a long time for these 
solutions with event horizon to settle down. It is known that these solutions settle down to very simple solutions. Often they settle down to very simple solutions labeled by only a few parameters like conserved charges, like mass, which is equivalent to energy, charge, if there is any Maxwell field, or angular momentum if it's spinning. So no information on matters other than these uh, conserved charges are usually available in the final black hole solutions. And we often call it no hair theorem, okay? This no hair behavior, or the fact that we are missing almost all information about the matters that form black holes is related to the existence of event horizon. So I guess you can see the cursor. So, so this is the evolution of time and the horizontal X slices of space. So the central region is where the matters have been collapsing and it makes a it makes a region around it beyond which no I mean, I mean region, region around it with a boundary called event horizon and any event happening within this event horizon cannot escape out to the external observer so an external observer doesn't have access to the all the microscopic information of the matters that has been collapsed to form the black holes it's a bit like the practical attitude we assume when you study macroscopic systems, you know, like a gas system of gas formed by Avogadro number of atoms. You know, all the microscopic atomistic information is uh, virtually practically inaccessible. And we try to describe them using only a few sets of macroscopic parameters. You know, the details may look a bit different, but the black hole no hair theorem is heading towards something similar. <clears throat> the very surprising fact is that the missing information about the black holes induces what we know as the thermodynamic behaviors. So it's, it's common feature in macroscopic system around us. If we only have an access to a few macroscopic parameters like volume, energies, and so on about the system, then from hundreds of years ago, we have been developing an effective description to describe them, which is called thermodynamics. It's a surprising fact that the black holes with intrinsic missing information admit the same kind of thermodynamic uh, behaviors, which is a consequence of the Einstein equation of motion of general relativity. So in particular, it obeys a few laws of thermodynamics, most importantly, the first law and the second law. So the first law can be stated as if you perturb a given black hole by, let's say, throwing in some matters and deforming, I mean, letting evolve, it can have these mass and conserved charge parameters changing. But if you look at how the energy carried or the mass carried by the black hole changes, it carries a particular term, which formally can be called as a heat transfer. So it's a product of the surface gravity of the event horizon times the variation of the area of the surface gra surface area of the event horizon. So, I mean, formally we can regard this extra contribution as a heat because it takes a form of uh, temperature times the variation of entropy. So it's a formal first law obeyed by a black hole. A bit more surprising fact that has been shown by Hawking is that a general consequence of general relativity demands that once the horizon is formed, the area of the event horizon should never decrease as time evolves. So it formally takes the structure of the second law of thermodynamics. If you try to identify this area as the entropy, whatever it means. So there has been some formal thermodynamic law of black holes established in the 60s and 70s. The shocking behavior found by Hawking in mid 70s, which made us to regard them as a serious thermodynamics rather than just an analog, is that Hawking has shown that the black hole incorporated with certain quantum, uh, prop, I mean, if you analyze the quantum effects around these black holes, Hawking has shown that these black holes actually emit a small thermal radiation whose temperature is actually shown to be proportional to the surface gravity. Okay? So it's a very, I mean, for macroscopic black holes, it's a really tiny thermal radiation, so it's, almost impossible to expect that we can detect them. But the theory of the basic rules of thermodynamics and gravity, the basic rules of quantum mechanics and gravity demand that black holes actually emit a tiny a thermal radiation, indeed proportional to the surface gravity. So this leads us to the identification of the area of the event horizon, 
precisely normalized in terms of the fundamental constants of nature as the entropy sort of carried by these black holes. So we call this Bekenstein Hawking entropy. And since the discovery of Hawking, and many people have been working hard, working on quantum gravity to establish the fact that this Bekenstein Hawking entropy indeed admits a statistical interpretation of the log of number of states, possible states, carried by the matters which are lurking behind the event horizon of black holes and forming the black holes. So studies along this line for many decades have been falling into the two categories. Okay? One study which I just mentioned is trying to further establish that this Bekenstein Hawking entropy is the, coming from real statistical mechanics. Another reverse way of research, which, which, which possibly will be my emphasis today, is to accept this thermodynamic interpret, I mean, statistical mechanical interpretation of this analog thermodynamics as a real thermodynamics, and then trying to explore its implications about the underlying system. Because as I'll explain to you, this thermodynamics of black holes is a very exotic one. And it will tell us very exotic natures of quantum gravity itself. So these have been an interesting studies that have been made for, for the past 30 years or something. So before proceeding, let me pause for a while and explain, the, I mean, think about the concept of, and by the way, if you have questions, I mean, you can interrupt any time, I think. I mean, I don't really have to finish all the contents and please interrupt any time. I talk about the notion of entropy because it's a very subtle thing. The notion of entropy is very subtle in many ways. First of all, it's interesting quantity because it's genuinely a quantum quantity. You know, if you, it's basically with given values of the macroscopic parameters, the entropy is defined to be the log of number of quantum states at fixed values of these parameters. So it's intrinsically defined in a quantum mechanical manner. Another more odd feature is that the entropy is, it's hard to say that it's measuring a definite phenomenon. It's measuring the possibilities once we are given certain physical information of the system, okay? It's the number of states possible, but you know, not all of them are realized. The system is in a definite state. It rather measures our ignorance because it measures the possibilities with the information we have. It measures the inform in ignorance of the observer, namely the information unavailable to an observer uh, about the system. And presumably in this case of black holes, the information hidden behind the event horizon, which is unobsessable to observer outside. It's definitely a useful quantity from which direct thermodynamic observables can be easily understood, maybe taking derivative of entropy, or, you know, studying the change of entropy, but the entropy itself is a very odd quantity. You know, it's a, it's a theoretical notion, I would say, really. Very ironically, this abstract observable entropy has been a key testing observable in the theory of quantum theory of gravity. It has been a key observable string theory, so quantum, field, quantum gravity people have been trying to understand in terms of statistical mechanics of the quantum gravity models. For instance, string theory and the non-perturbative objects there and so on. So I'd like to emphasize these two dual aspects of the entropy. It's a very weird observable from observational sense. On the other hand, it has been conceptually very useful observable to probe the properties of black holes. For black holes, this entropy enjoys a very uh, important property, which I'll explain now. And this is called the Bekenstein, Bekenstein bound of entropy. By studying the matters possibly collapsing into black holes, Bekenstein has carried out lots of thought experiments, and he has uh, obtained a conclusion that an entropy, which is carried by any body, any matter, is bounded from above by this quantity. So it's given in terms of Boltzmann constants, Planck constants, speed of light, but doesn't contain Newton constants. It says that if a body or a matter carries energy and has a characteristic size R, you know, this, the, the spatial length that it occupies, Bekenstein has argued that the maximal entropy that the body can carry is bounded from the multiplication of the size and the energy. He obtained this conclusion 
by considering otherwise and uh, extracting out a contradiction, assuming the black hole physics. So if supposing that such a body carries more entropy than this upper bound, such a matter is really argued to collapse down to a black hole whose black hole will carry a Bekenstein Hawking entropy, which is smaller than this. So if you really interpret the Bekenstein Hawking entropy as a statistical entropy, it will, an object carrying more entropy than this will time evolve to decrease its entropy, which is a contradiction to the second law. So by this kind of thought experiment, Bekenstein has put this upper bound on the entropy that can be carried by anybody in our nature. And by definition, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of a black hole saturates this bound. It's a very weird and strange observation in many ways because of the reason I just said in the previous slide. The entropy itself rarely has an absolute definition, right? More importantly, in usual, let's say, particle physics, where we try to explore smaller and smaller and smaller structures, the definition of entropy of the number of states depend on the short distance cutoff that you set, right? If you're studying the atomistic scale physics, you never care about the internal structures and internal degrees of freedom carried by quarks and gluons. So the entropy that you define at certain length or energy scale is insensitive to the really short distance scale that you might be ignorant about, right? So the modest way of viewing the entropy is that it should be a quantity which is sensitive to your UV cutoff of the considerations. But this claim is a really bold one. It never access, I mean, it, it, it never addresses the UV cutoff of the description that you're having or the viewpoint you're having. It just gives you the absolute upper bound of the entropy or the degrees of freedom that can be carried by anybody, right? So, so my, uh, minor clarification? Yes, please. Yeah, so when you write R as the size of the body, do you mean it's like, at least in, in, in that time, is it like proportional to the volume or the area in that case? Yeah, so you, you mean what is the definition of R, right? Right. It's, it's a certain notion and people have been, you know, if, if it's a sp spherically symmetric one, it's a radius. I mean, if it's rotating, squashed, and people have, I mean, people have paid some effort to more precisely uh, clarify what R should mean. So it, it's a bit subtle story, I think. But, but the people have been establishing what R should mean in more complicated situations. I see. And another- Yeah, it, it's, it's a subtle notion, yeah. Okay. But, but let me just now say it very roughly, the characteristic size of the system. I see, I see. So, and another question was in the previous slide when you defined the surface gravity. So typically yeah. what we do is you define a particular maybe coordinate system, then you have a Schwarzschild radius and you define the surface gravity on the Schwarzschild radius. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Is it is it a code this kappa? Is it a coordinate dependent number? No, no, it's an independent one. Independent one. I mean, I forgot the definition, but you can define it independently. What right. is it? Uh, studying the geodesic near this event horizon, and I mean, it's some intrinsically defined, you know, definable quantity. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Any other? Uh, I also have a quick question uh, about the uh, upper bound. Yes. Uh, can Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Uh, Maybe a very nice question. Uh, does it mean that uh, if a given energy E is spread in a larger system, uh, can we have a larger entropy? I just want you to understand the upper limit. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it just, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just the uh, upper bound. It's just the upper bound. The upper bound can be larger if the same energy is spread over a larger region of. You know, the, you, 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 well, um, um, yes, yes. Uh, I, I think, um, I, 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 yeah, I think you can understand it by I mean, understand it better by seeing how it's saturated by, let's say, the Schwarzschild black hole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Schwarzschild black hole has what? Energy is the mass, and mass is proportional to the Schwarzschild mm -hmm. radius, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it means that for the black holes, the right hand side is given by R square, R square, which is nothing but the event horizon area. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, you know, the system gets larger, the entropy gets uh, larger as R square. It just means that, yeah, yeah, the black hole is large. I I mean, the, you know, I mean, the corresponding black hole is large, so the upper bound of the entropy can be proportional to certain powers of R. I see, I see. Yeah. Because, because the contradiction happens because when the entropy of a body becomes larger than the corresponding Bekenstein Hawking entropy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Is I it? See. Is it? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So 
you know, the, the, yeah, so I, I'd like to emphasize again that this kind of upper bound is a very weird one. You know, it's not referring at all about any UV cutoff of the system. It's a fundamentally given bound. It's probably related to the recent studies of entropy, including gravity, whether it depends on short UV cutoff and so on, like, oh yeah, this, this sus kind and uplam and witness and so on. But anyway, it has been around for a long while. And by this way, this Bekenstein Hawking entropy is giving us an absolute notion of entropy, not relative one, depending on the UV cutoff of the person of person that is considering this question. And by this way, way uh, it is giving an exceptional channel to see the absolutely fundamental information about the nature. It really says that no more information can be stored with this energy and this characteristic size. And by taking advantage of this, this fortunate channel, we'd like to understand by studying the Bekenstein arcing of the black holes, we'd like to understand the properties of the matters that are forming the black holes at the most elementary level. For instance, you know, black holes carry a large mass or energy. So at the large energy regime, how many fundamental degrees of freedom should be carried by these matters? I mean, as I mean, seen by the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So that's the subject that I'm going to try to explain now. How odd is the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the black hole? And what kind of lesson we can draw out about the matters forming black holes? I, I have a question. Yeah, please. So, <clears throat> So this this formula of upper bound. Yes. You said it has no information of UV cutoff. Right, right. But uh, it contains the Planck Planck constant. Oh, it's a fundamental constant of nature, and the UV cutoff is our ignorance about the nature. You know. You so decide yeah. which scale you want to describe a system. If you want to describe the atomistic scale. Maybe you can set small one Fermi as your short distance cutoff. You're gonna be you're declaring yourself to be ignorant about that. That mm -hmm. artificial cutoff is not present. My question is, when you introduce this Planck constant, you somehow h bar, yeah, h bar. Somehow you introduce uh, implicitly the length scale, so called the Planck length scale. No, 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 no. Planck length scale is. Uh... <laughs> H bar is just relating length and momentum. Right. Length times momentum is H bar. So it's not giving us an absolute length scale. Planck length scale is given by the Newton constant that for gravity. Newton constant is square of the Planck length scale, and that doesn't enter here. Is that right? Right, right, right. What do you mean by Planck, Planck length scale? You mean? Yeah. The, the strength of the gravity, right? It is given by some combination with the Planck constant times some other fundamental constant. So, yeah, but I don't know what the other fundamental constant means, but that's absent here. All right. Just h bar, just h bar and c. Another question is that yeah. uh, this formula also contain, contains the, the length scale r. Uh -huh. uh, in your previous slide, usually this uh, entropy is usually the entropy is proportional to to the area, but now you you have just length. So is there any any reason you have? Oh oh oh. So so, so, so for dimensional ground, yeah, it, it it's true that it's proportional to the area, but it's of course made dimensionless by dividing with other dimension for quantity. The new the, the, the what is this this the the Newton constant for gravity, okay. So uh, the absolute requirement we should put is that any expression for entropy should be dimensionless. Okay, and the fact that it's proportional to area is the characteristic property of a black black hole. Right. Now, if you go back to this formula, it's made dimensionless by combining R and E. So in the natural unit where h bar and c is all one, energy is having a reverse dimension as the length, so it's dimensionless again. So this now. Now for black holes, how the area law is exhibited, that's the question you ask. And I explained it when I think Professor Song Eun Jung was asking the question. The energy of the black hole is uh, proportional to the Schwarzschild radius, the size of the black hole in certain units. Mm -hmm. So that the right hand side becomes proportional to R square, which is the area. Okay, thank you. Okay.
Uh, so, um, I have some Can questions. Can I ask um, a question? Yeah, anybody. I want to ask a question. You. Yes, both of you. Yes, yes. A any of you. Yeah, please. Please pass. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, is this entropy applied to only black hole or it can be applied to anybody? Oh, this bound. And the claim yeah, is bound. that it can be applied to anybody. It can be applied anybody. to my laptop, to you, everything. So, independent of matter, yeah. whether it is uh, formed of any kind of uh, microscope structures, right? Right, right, right. Because, you know, if they have mass and energy, okay. and if you squeeze it enough, we believe they can form black holes. If a matter can squeeze oh. to form a black hole, the entropy bound should be applied to such a matter. That's the claim. Okay. So I, I wonder how you can, how can you obtain that a kind of uh, upper bound? Is that only, uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The, the, the argument I basically only, explained- only it, 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 Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I explained the, uh, the argument, uh, but, but I, I'm going to repeat it. So suppose that this bound is violated okay. by certain body, okay? Then one can argue okay. that certain body that violates this bound collapses to form a black hole. Mm -hmm. And the black hole formed this way has an entropy smaller than this upper bound because the black hole entropy is now parametrized by the Bekeji's knocking entropy. And this leads to a contradiction of the second law of thermodynamics. That's the, that's the rough structure of the argument. So the essential part is the matters violating this condition can collapse to form a black hole. So somehow the, such such argument uh, is based on uh, some black hole physics, but yes. uh, the upper bound doesn't contain the gravitational constant. So yes. uh, can I say uh, this upper bound uh, should be true even in quantum gravity regime? Quantum. Quantum, quantum well, gravity. It's, yeah, it's quantum. Because yes, it doesn't yes. contain any uh, okay. gravitational constant, so it seems to be universal. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Somehow yeah. it may be true uh, even in deep quantum gravity region. Uh, am I right? Well, I mean, n n not having Newton constant is making it more <laughs> universal, right? Yeah. I mean, the the calculation is anyway carried out in the region where semi-classical considerations are reliable. So, yeah. I mean, widely, yeah. I mean, anyway, we're going to yeah. describe, study macroscopic bodies and macroscopic objects with large yeah. enough mass and energies. So we're not really going to describe, uh, I mean, we're going to describe objects that kind of, uh, yes, it's, it's, I mean, we, we, I, It is surprising uh, to see this upper bound doesn't contain a uh, gravitational constant. Right, uh, right. Although uh, the underlying argument is based on black hole physics. Is that okay, surprising okay. me? Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, it's a surprising <laughs> proposal. I mean, yeah. We can sit down and carefully follow the der argument or derivation by back engineering. It's a surprising thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I agree. We, we can do it sometime. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Anyway, that's a fortunate formula with which we can use the Bekeji knocking entropy, hopefully to probe the fundamental nature of the, the entropic information of the underlying matter system. And if you trust this viewpoint and start to study the black hole thermodynamics, it starts to exhibit a very, very exotic behavior. So the exotic entropy of the black holes is related to the exotic thermodynamic behaviors that we expect them to exhibit. So for instance, let us consider the Schwarzschild black holes, let's say in three plus one dimensions. We all know that, I mean, well, I don't know. I mean, the, the, the prediction of Hawking that the black hole should make a thermal radiation is accompanied with a supplementary fact that if the black hole is larger and larger, the temperature of the thermal radiation is smaller and smaller so that it's hard to observe them empirically, right? So more, in, in more quantitatively, the Hawking temperature of the black hole in three plus one dimension is computed by Hawking to be inversely proportional to its energy or mass, okay? If energy is inversely proportional to temperature, you know that it has a negative specific heat, right? It's the rate of the change of energy as you change the temperature. It's a very weird specific thermodynamic behavior. 
And the similar phenomenon is true for all Schwarzschild black holes in other dimensions, let's say where gravity is dynamical. The temperature of the system is always shown to be inversely proportional to certain power of energy. And if you really seek for the origin of why that happens, it's just because the entropy grows too fast as a function of energy or mass, okay? So entropy normally grows as energy, so it's first derivative positive. The weird property of the black holes is that the second derivative of the entropy is also positive. So in instead of having a convex growth of entropy as a function of energy, it makes a concave growth. So if you go to higher and higher energies, it grows much and much faster. This kind of behavior makes the fact that the heat capacity, heat capacity is negative because the inverse temperature is given as the derivative of entropy. Okay? If you make a second derivative, if it's negative, it means that the inverse temperature is a decreasing function of energy, giving a positive specific heat. But the other way around, like black hole, if the entropy is an, making an accelerated increase in terms of energy, it gives a negative specific heat. Okay? So perhaps you've been thinking that, oh, entropy is a fast growing function of energy for macroscopic system, but that's not true. It's a growing function of entropy. It's a big quantity, but en energy becomes larger and larger for normal thermodynamic system around us. It makes a, uh, it, it makes a rather slow growth, I mean, meaning that the growth is convex. But for the black hole, it's concave. That's the reason for the having negative specific heat. If you regard this as an entropy, as represent this entropy as representing fundamental degrees of freedom in our nature, it raises very puzzling in implications. You know, you know, there are occasionally systems in our nature with negative specific heat, but you can understand why that happened by some cheap arguments. I mean, we never believe it's a fundamental property of the nature. I mean, if it doesn't include black holes and gravity, but once you include the physics of gravity and black holes, in, in interpreting this entropy as a fundamental representation of the degrees of freedom, you know, it really means that, it really implies that if you go to higher and higher energy, the number of degrees of freedom should be extremely large, okay? So it really demands an unusual structure of the Hilbert space of the underlying quantum systems, okay? Very fast growth of entropy in high energy regime. Okay. Let me try to explain to you why this concave increase of entropy is quite an odd thing. And we can compare it with the usual particle physics because the usual particle physics and go without gravity, go to high energy regime and rough estimate of the entropy shows that it, it never grows this fast. So just consider relativity particles in these space time, these spatial dimensions having very, very high energy. And if the energy is very high, all the particles that are involved can be regarded as massless particles. And if you have finite species of particles like in standard model or so on, at very high energy, so you're computing the thermodynamic quantity of a massless particles. So since there are no characteristic scales now involved, on dimensional grounds, you can uh, predict how the entropy and the energy should uh, behave as a function of temperature because energy and temperature have dimension of mass, energy, entropy is dimensionless, and both entropy and energy are extensive quantities, so they should be proportional to the volume. That gives the following temperature dependence of energy and entropy. And eliminating T, you get the entropy as a function of energy. It grows, but it's a mild growth. You see, it's always a convex growth. It's actually very, I mean, yeah. So, so, so in, in almost all examples that you have been studying in statmic, the large entropy is basically a con convex growth. It's a very, very slow growth as you go to higher and higher energy. So it really means that in usual particle physics systems, if you go to high and high energy, you don't really have that many fundamental degrees of freedom. However, this fast growth of entropy beyond this convex growth incident, incidentally has been quite familiar in quantum gravity, by which I mean virtually string theory. It has been known for a long while from I think 80s or so on, 1980s, that the elementary strings, if you consider all the possible oscillations of these elementary strings, uh, the high energy entropy or the density of states is shown to be linear in temperature, where the coefficient is called the hydrogen temperature. It's given by the fundamental string tension. So it's not yet a con concave growth, but it's much faster. It's just a linear growth. It's much faster than 
the convex growth that is usually in particle physics. And this much faster growth, which happens for strings, is that the string is basically containing an infinite tower of oscillation modes. Basically, one string is equivalent to an infinite tower of particles. So if you have infinite tower of particles, it's normally supposed to have much larger entropy or the degrees of freedom than a finite set of particles. We call this growth a hydrogen growth. It has been famous from the 1960s in the context of strong interactions. You know, it's the time when we are trying to interpret all the mesons and baryons, the tower of mesons and baryons as fundamental particles. And uh, hydrogen has shown that it exhibits the following high temperature growth. And that kind of uh, story has been uh, uh, in, uh, have been have been repeated in the context of uh, uh, in the context of string theory in the 1980s to show that the strings elementary string has a similar growth of entropy at high energy. So this is a context in which we can have a much faster growing entropy than ordinary particle physics. However. This perturbative entropy growth for elementary strings is not growing fast enough to account for black holes because it's not yet concave. In order to incorporate the concave growth of entropy, I mean, to explain the black hole entropy microscopically, elementary string description of quantum gravity is not enough. That's what black hole says. In retrospect, what happened to be necessary is to incorporate the non-perturbative degrees of freedom of quantum gravity like string theory. And that will increase this linear growth up to the concave growth. So that has been the subject in the mid nineties. Yeah. Uh, Professor Kim, uh, I have a simple question. So Please, for D brain, what is the energy dependence of entropy? Energy dependence of entropy. And, uh, uh, -brain. The, 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 the bound states of D brains and fundamental string, it will be, it will be this, the concave growth. You know, ah. uh, you have to set up the problem carefully because the D brain has to wrap something. Yes. But if it wraps okay. certain internal space to make a black hole, I mean, to make a, a bound state particle, its entropy growth will be much faster than linear. And that's what make, and that's what explains the microscopic structures of the black hole entropy. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I mean, your question is just answered uh, in this slide. Yes, yes. Other, was there another question? Oh, yeah, I have a question. Yes. Uh, you never mentioned fundamental degree of freedom in black hole to calculate entropy. In New Jersey, I never mentioned case, the... one, 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 one base uh, degree of freedom to calculate entropy. Is it? Yeah, that, yeah, I, 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 I didn't mention I didn't mention any whatever. fundamental formulation yet, but here and there I mentioned that it will be string theory. Uh, used to compute the entropy. That's what I'm going to explain in the next slide, in words. Was that the okay. question? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, also, that relations that you uh, mentioned for the uh, uh, for the strange behavior of entropy, for example, it can be applied to photon, for example. A photon have that kind of behavior, T is 3, and uh, energy is 4. <laughs> Is that photon? Photon. The is formula that, you see is for photon. You're talking this, about the, this formula you see yeah, that, that, that this on is my brief, cursor. This, this is for photon. Week. What? Photon, yeah. right? Yeah, for photon is photon. a massless particle, so this formula is applicable. Oh yeah, so photon yeah. has negative uh, heat capacity, right? No, 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 no. Positive. And uh, positive. Ah, is positive. It, uh, because it's convex. Positive here. Positive, I mean, oh. if the oh, if the convex. growth is convex, this is convex, as you see, you know, this uh, this power is smaller than one, okay. so it's convex. So the entropy, okay. if it's okay. if it's a convex function and he specifically this positive, if it's concave, so if if this power is larger than one, it's negative. Okay, is this mechanics? For example, there's there a system uh, uh, where the entropy decreases with the Energy. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not denying negative. that. There are occasions in which oh, yeah. what exotic I mean is, behavior of entropy uh, can happen. Can happen. I'm, I'm not denying negativity that. Negativity of the temperature. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I know negative that. Negative temperature, negative I know that. heat capacity is. Uh... <laughs> I, 
I know okay. that, but but you know right. those entities are never is... interpreted fundamentally. That's the point. That entropy is never interpreted fundamentally. Okay. But now that's why I explained the Bekenstein Bekenstein bound of the entropy. You know, an object saturating the Bekenstein bound, its entropy is supposed, very heuristically, supposed to describe the fundamental degrees of freedom of the nature. So we are interpreting this fact more seriously. Is, is this point clear? I think I motivated this point where, you know, you know. Okay. Let's go ahead. You know, if you yeah. if you consider like yeah. I mean, there are many examples where specific heat is negative. You know, if you consider a collapsing star, for a certain while its specific heat is known to be negative, but nobody worries about it because it's not a fundamental aspect. I hope this point is clear. Okay, <laughs> so where were I? Yeah, so the fundamental. The perturbative strings entropy is much larger than those of standard particle physics, but it's not yet concave. It's not growing fast enough to in incorporate the increase of the blackboard entropy. So the progress has been happening in the mid nineties when the non-perturbative techniques of string theory has been developed. So in 1995, uh, Joe Polchiski has discovered some objects called D brains. They're like solitons in quantum field theory like monopoles, vortices, and so on. There are degrees of freedom which are much heavier than elementary strings. But in principle, if you have this non-perturbative object, you can consider the bound states of these uh, non-perturbative objects with the elementary strings and consider uh, and construct much, much more than many, many more states than the elementary string states that I explained to you. So considering suitable bound states of deep non-perturbative objects and elementary strings, people have engineered a quantum system which can uh, form the black hole in the, the gravitating regime. And furthermore, use this quantum system. I can write down the quantum mechanics in detail, but this is a colloquium, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to emphasize that uh, there's a definite quantum mechanical description of this system derived from string theory, from which you can try to honestly compute and study the entropy at high energy regime. And these are reproducing black holes. And more surprisingly, these are reproducing the concave behavior of the entropy increase. More precisely, this kind of quantitative justification of Bekenstocking entropy from statistical point of view has been carried out in very specially controlled uh, special black holes that's very often called the extremal black holes or BPS black holes having more symmetry structures. The characteristic of these black holes is that they carry electric charges and their masses are getting proportional to this electric charge. So for these black holes, charge is playing the role of mass. So we're gonna see how the entropy behaves as a function of charge instead of mass. Because mass is a function of charge. As a function of charge or mass, these are the entropies of these special classes of black holes in various space-time dimensions. And indeed they are forming, they are showing this concave behavior. So like having negative specific heat for charge black holes, they have negative susceptibility, right? And this kind of concave growth has been precisely computed, justified, including coefficient from microscopic string theory models of quantum gravity. Okay. So this really establishes the fact that number one, number eight, the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy can be understood from statistical considerations of quantum gravity systems. And number B, the exotic behavior of the entropy growth of black holes, the concave growth has been made possible by using the unusually high number, large number of degrees of freedoms of quantum gravity in high energy regime. Okay. That's the difference with uh, the part or particle physics systems without gravity. So that has been a triumph uh, from the mid nineties. Okay. Any question till this point? Good, good, good. So, let me pause for a while and explain what we have understood, because I think this is a, I mean, I'm not sure precisely where I'm heading to, but I think this is a very, this has a far reaching uh, implication. You know, this fast growth of the black hole entropy, I explained to you, is intimately related to the fundamental structure of the Hilbert space of quantum gravity. At, I mean, in that the high energy entropy has to grow very, very fastly. 
And it gives a more natural setting in which an exotic model like string theory has to be the description of quantum gravity. You know, in the early days of string theory, the way we motivated string theory is the following. We try to naively quantize the general relativity of gravity explored by Einstein regarding this metric field as an uh, elementary field representing the graviton particle. And then we encounter a certain quantum inconsistency like the ultraviolet divergence of quantum field theory and so on. And, and the, this kind of standard quantization procedure of particles physics is just not working. And then people try hard and a recipe comes down from the sky. If you suppose that a particle is replaced by a string with infinitely many number of oscillating modes, then somehow these divergences go away and you can have a consistent quantum theory of gravity. That was the way of motivating st string theory until quite recently. That's good, but that's very, very convoluted way of motivating a thing. And it's, in a sense, a very ugly generalization of the beautiful particle physics, which uses only a few number of fields, like standard model. Right? Now with the black hole physics understood, we can have a bit more natural explanation about why this kind of clumsy thing has to happen. Without throwing in that many degrees of freedom like string theory did, it just cannot explain the fast growth of the entropy carried by the black hole, which is a universal object that we see in general relativity, right? So, you know, if you employ this viewpoint, a clumsy formulation like string theory had to have had to appear to describe a consistent theory of black gravity explaining black hole thermodynamics. And at this point, I, I think it will be very interesting to pause and review because there are. I mean, a few other proposals made about the quantum theory of gravity, it will be interesting to review how other models of quantum gravity explain black hole thermodynamics related to the fast growth of the number of degrees of freedom and the number of fundamental degrees of freedom they carry. I pose this question, I never studied them myself yet, but I, I'm just gonna do it, I want to do it seriously one day, hopefully in the near future. For instance, there have been many models suggested for quantum theory of gravity. Some of them are serious, some of them are more, more more coarse models like higher spin gravity, loop quantum gravity, or asymptotically free quantum gravity. Apparently in my eyes, some of them don't have enough number of degrees of freedom. And I really want to review myself how they address the physics of black hole thermodynamics. This is the regime of my ignorance, but I mean, I think it will be a very interesting point to study at some point. Right, this is my comment about uh, the establishment I explained so far. Okay, any question? How much time do I have, by the way? I think you have uh, 40 minutes. It's, it's total one and a half hour? Yeah, usually. Okay, it's very generous. So, okay, so <laughs> I, I, I wasn't minding getting too many questions. So, because I was ready to stop at any moment. So, but okay, one and a half will be enough. But still, yeah. if you have questions, please interrupt me. I can stop at any moment. Okay. So, this is so one. Just, uh, just a curious observation that in your previous two formulas, if I, if I formula? I, in the previous two formulas, which shows the dependency of the entropy with respect to the energy, yeah, these formula, the classic, yeah. the quantum field theory one and the string theory one. So yeah. it, it seems that if you take D going to infinity, both these models have the same behavior of entropy with respect to energy. D going to infinity. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> So it, I mean, uh, is it is it fair to say that should you try and define your quantum field theory in sufficiently large number of dimensions, you can have possibly? Uh, I, I think I think that's very drastic. Um, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, I mean, it, it's just an observation that the the, the limit sort of yeah. match in large D limit. That's all. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand. I understand, but I mean, uh, I, I'm a bit afraid to. <laughs> I'm a bit afraid to think that. I mean. Um, yeah, I mean, large D are very, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, maybe. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. I explained this weird and strange aspect, and I mean, the fast growing entropy, negative specificity, and, and I try to enforce to you that that's an aspect of the quantum gravity or string theory that has been developed so far. But you know, if you really think, Naturally, this cannot be fundamentally true, right? It's really, really ugly resolution of this fundamental question. You know, you know, if you fundamentally have a system with negative specific heat, I mean, it's very weird. I mean, 
you know, the, the, the thing with, you know, in, in thermodynamics, the point with positive specific heat is that such a system can be coupled to a heat bath and you can consider the system in a canonical ensemble with fixed temperature, varying energies. It means that if what I have explained so far is fundamentally true, you can never undergo such consideration. You always have to fix energy and do the micro canonical analysis and all kinds of canonical questions, related thermal questions are ill-posed. That might be the case. That might be the nature of, of our world. But although it might be a logically a possibility, I, I think it sounds very weird. Rather, what, I think it's more likely, and, and it's not just me, that many people facing this high energy catastrophe of the thermodynamic behavior of string theory and quantum gravity, I mean, many people are thinking that it might be more natural that quantum gravity has to be fundamentally reformulated in this high energy or high temperature regime so that this weird fast growth of the entropy has to be tamed down, right? And maybe a motivation can be found by a similar phenomenon that people have observed in the strength, uh, in the strong interaction of nuclei and QCD. In 60s, people finding many mesons and baryonic resonances, I mean, infinite tower of them maybe, it, you know, if you investigate the number of hadrons as a function, as, as the increase in the mass, you really seem to find an infinite tower of them, like you found an infinite tower of oscillations in string theory. So at that time, people re thought about, how about the scenario that all these hadrons are infinitely many fundamental degrees of freedom, showing hydrogen growth and so on. But the final resolution about the strong interaction of particle physics was that hadrons are not independent degrees of freedom at high energy. They're made as bound states of quarks and gluons, much fewer degrees of freedom. And at high temperature, the system which exhibits hadrons as their spectrum at low energy should undergo a phase transition at high temperature in which the plasma of quarks and gluons are the right description. So it's a reformulation of strong interaction at high temperature in terms of quarks and gluons. And it's quite tempting to speculate that quantum gravity states that we have saw from black holes originate from a more fundamental and fewer degrees of freedom, which, which can be barely visible at even higher energy scale that I have been explained to you so far. So this is the possibility that we'll strongly have in mind, right? That the, I've been already explaining the number of states at large enough energy, but we are going to the really, really extreme energies in which in which these large number of states that I've explained so far come from more basic ingredients like quarks and gluons that explain the hadrons. But in order to address this kind of scenario, you have to set up your question very carefully because let's say uh, the, uh, if you want to consider the gravitational system and, and try to address lots of thermal questions like at fixed temperature and so on, you have to be more elaborate than what I've explained so far. So this is what I'm going to briefly explain to you. So in order to address a system at fixed temperature, you know, if you if you if you discuss the system in microcanonical ensemble, you fix the energy, you fix the so-called expensive quantity of the system, which defines the size of the system, right? But in canonical ensemble, you're fixing the temperature, which is an intensive quantity. Okay. If you just fix the intensive quantity, you have to fix the size of the system by putting the system in a finite volume. You know, in microcanonical ensemble, you fix the energy, so there's no issue about the scaling of the system because you fix the energy to be large and fixed. But if you fix the temperature of the system, you basically have to put the system in a finite volume because all the extensive quantities has to scale with that. But if you consider black holes in asymptotically flat space time, as I have been doing so far, that kind of cutoff, the finite size volume is absent. But the weird point comes in here because in gravity, you know, if you do some ideal gas in, in your lab, you just put an artificial box, very large one. But in gravity, that cannot be done because every object, including the wall of this artificial box, has to be subject to the equivalence principle. You have to really put the box carefully and consistently so that the gravitational phenomena can be trapped in it. That's what we have to do first in order to address the thermal questions involving black holes really comprehensively. I first try to explain to you how to put this finite box in gravity or infrared regu long distance regulators 
and address lots of interesting thermodynamic questions there involving black holes heading towards a more better formulation of quantum gravity. That's what I'm going to do now. Any question about? So one nice way of putting the gravity in a finite box is to consider gravity phenomena, not in asymptotically sp flat space time, which is just infinity, but to consider the gravitational system in what is called the anti to zeta space time, which I'm going to roughly explain to you now. In short, it's called ADS. It's named against a person called the sitter, which is very unusual way of naming things. And naturally, anti the sitter space time is associated with what is called the de sitter space time. The sitter space time is a space time of homogeneous and isotropic space time with positive curvature, positive constant curvature, and it plays crucial role in understanding our universe and cosmology. It represents the sitter space time represents an accelerating universe, which means that the length scale measured by the metric is exponentially growing as a function of time. Antidista space time is named against this, the sister space time, and instead it has the length scale exponentially growing as one moves around one dis spatial distance. Okay, so it, this this the sister space time has length scale exponentially growing as a function of time direction. Antidista space time has its length scale exponentially growing as one of the spatial directions. So that's the difference. So the antitista space time, uh, one of the way of representing it is using this metric. If you don't know what's for the metric, never mind. I'll explain it in picture. The time coordinate, and one coordinate is called the radius of this antitista space time. So the vertical axis is time. The horizontal slice is the space of this universe. And rho is called the radial coordinate in the spatial section. That is the center of this radio, center of this universe at rho equal to zero. If you go to larger and large rho, you approach the boundary, boundary at infinity of this uh, space. Okay. So this metric is called the metric of the antidistal space time. L is the radius of curvature of this space time. Due to the fact that this uh, length scale exponentially grows as a function of radial direction in ADS, it exhibits a confining behavior of all the massive bodies. Okay, so if you if you remember, if you have heard of this general relativity course once in your life, the one thing you have learned is that the time component of the metric in Newtonian approximation measures the Newton potential, the Newton one of our potential that you learned in the high school. Abusing this Newtonian approximation abusing this Newtonian approximation, you see that the, new, you know, the gravitational potential measured by this uh, length growth is scaling exponentially. Okay. So this exponential growth of length scale as you go to infinity in antidistal space-time means that this system, this antidistal system is providing an exponential confining box to any gravitating or any energetic objects uh, which are moving around in this space-time. So it naturally provides a confining box to this the gravitational system, including the massive particles and even the black holes. So this naturally provides the role of the confining box in which lots of thermodynamic questions are much better behaved and so on. So this is the setup in which we can consider, we will consider the thermophysics of black holes uh, in much more detail than I've explained to you so far in an effective gravitational box. Incidentally, this is a second technical benefit. It has been shown by Juan Maldacena from 25 years ago or something that we know a full microscopic description of such quantum gravity. In principle, we say that string theory is a quantum gravity, but the shameful status is that string theory is never formulated to completion. So in general situation, we don't really know what string theory is and how to use it to do all the detailed studies of quantum gravity. But what Malda Sena has proposed to us is that in quantum four quantum gravity in entities, the space time, there is a principle in which we can in principle study all the quantum gravitational phenomena. And, and that principle has called the, been called the holographic principle. We often call it ADSCF correspondence. But the principle that Malda Sena says is that, you know, if you have this anti the space time, it has a boundary with one less dimension at rho equal to infinity. 
and at rho equal to infinity, such apparently non-gravitational quantum mechanical system or quantum field theory system lives. And the proposal is that this quantum field theory system living at one lower dimension holographically describes the whole quantum gravity inside. I won't be reviewing it in too much detail, but it's a way that is allowed for us to study this quantum gravity phenomena quantitatively. In simple examples of this holographic ADS-CFT models, uh, it turns out that uh, the quantum field theory at living at the boundary is taking the form of usual gauge theory that we use to describe the quantum chromodynamics. It's associated with gauge groups, and this gauge theory is uh, supposed to represent semi-classical gravity when the size of the gauge symmetry becomes large, right? I mean, the limit where number of gluons are becoming large. Okay. So that's the prescription Malderson has given. You know, the way, the reason why gluon has to be large really has to do with the intricate structures of gravity and black holes you have to reproduce from quantum gravity. Like I, I explained to you that the quantum gravity have lots and lots of high energy degrees of freedom. To incorporate that, it really has to do a, be a large engage theory with large number of degrees of freedom. But anyway, the thing is that anti-distance space-time has dual benefit. It conceptually provides us a natural trapping box in which all thermodynamic questions can be rigorously defined and studied. Secondly, it provides a setting in which the full quantum gravity can in principle be formulated rigorously and studied. Um, so that's a setup in which, I, yes, yes. Uh, so suppose I'm trying to calculate usual Schwarzschild shield black hole entropy in flat space. Yes. In the parallel yeah. ensemble, there, is there a subtle some problem? Uh, so there is yeah, no it's, it's a negative specific heat, so it's thermodynamically unstable. You imagine so, you couple the system to heat death. On the small thermal fluctuation, it rolls, rolls out of it. So my question is, here you mentioned that entities the space may give some IR cutoff when everything becomes well defined yeah. in but if 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 I try to calculate entropy in plus space in gravitational as in so there mm -hmm. is no IR cutoff then is there any in chemical ensemble is there does it cause any problem or I mean you have to fix energy you have to do micro canonical <laughs> in canonical nobody knows how to do quantum gravity in asymptotic flat space time. Uh -huh. it, it's subtle. It, it, I mean nobody knows how to do it properly. What's the problem? You know, the dens density of states is, has an accelerated growth. It has negative specific. I mean, you know, no, nobody knows how to, I mean, you know, it, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. You know, the way thermal, you know, the way canonical ensemble works is the following, you know, you have the density of states, right? Mm. So it's, it's sort of growing. Mm. And in order to do the canonical ensemble in a thermodynamically stable way, you multiply by the Boltzmann factor, right? Yes. E to the minus B. And you multiply these two and you see for a peak, right? Mm. And whether you can, in this case, if the peak happens, the thermal oh, fluctuation is minimized, suppressed. And it doesn't yes. matter really whether you're doing it canonical grand canonical. Yes, yes. But you know, if this density of state is growing too fast, this peak is never formed. Mm -hmm. And related matter is that it's canonically unstable. If you couple it to a heat bath, it just becomes unstable under the infinitesimal fluctuation. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But this problem will go away if you define things more carefully in anti distance space time. <laughs> yeah. And in this kind of setup, the black hole that we have, yeah, I, I'm going to explain that. Yes. Yes. So this is the setup I'm going to study. Well, I'll be happy if you just can get rough qualitative picture rather than detailed formula and so on. So, Basically motivated by that, the fact that anti-distance space-time is providing a gravitational box, so hopefully thermodynamic question for black holes can be well addressed. Stephen Hawking and Don Page exactly had this hope, and sometime in the 1980s, they tried to study the property of Schwarzschild black holes in anti-distance space-time. It can be done in any space-time dimension, but I'm gonna explain most formulas in five-dimensional anti-distance space-time because of some particular technical reason, but most of the, all of the qualitative thing that I'm going to show you on the right side with this graph holds in any dimension, ADS4, ADS5, ADS6, blah, blah. So if you study, they constructed the Schwarzschild black holes in anti distal space time, asymptotically going to anti distal, and the black hole is sitting at the center. 
And they compute the area of the event horizon as a function of mass or the energy. Um, <laughs> they have obtained a plot of the entropy function, which looks like follows. Like follows. <laughs> so, you know, in anti distance space, there is a box, and there's a characteristic size of the box, which is the radius of the curvature of ADS. I set the box scale to be L, right? The size of the box to be L. If the size of the box is L, you have a black hole and its own size, you have to compare the size of the black hole and the size of the box. If the size of the black hole is much smaller than the size of the box, the rough physics of this black hole physics will be the same as the, as the black hole sitting in an asymptotically flat space time because tiny little black hole, much smaller than the box, will virtually not feel that it is in a confined box. But if the black hole mass grows and grows, Eventually, it will be a size comparable to the box size, and it can be larger than that. Gradually, the black hole will be filling this box, and the characteristic features of the black holes in antidistor will show up. The point is that the entropy function as a function of energy, when the energy or mass is very small, or equivalently when the size is small, is showing the characteristic concave behavior that I've explained to you in the context of asymptotically flat black holes. Because those two black holes are virtually the same if the black hole doesn't feel that there is a box far away. But if you increase the size of the black holes gradually, uh, well, it's called n square, but it's inverse of the Newton constant. If you increase the size gradually, as soon as the gravity, the black holes tends to fill the box and fill the ADS, the entropy growth gets milder and milder, and eventually it becomes convex to exhibiting more normal thermodynamics. This is the property of the black holes put in a finite box. If the black hole is much smaller than the box, it doesn't feel the box. If the black hole is size is comparable to the box, it feels the box and exhibits the more normal thermodynamic behavior, okay? So the convex versus concave. And if you put the temperature as a function of energy or the mass, you know, you, if you take the derivative of this curve, it's inverse temperature, and you inverse it and plot, you get this plot. So in the region when this black hole having entropy is concave, the temperature is a decreasing function of energy and it has negative specific heat. At certain point, uh, what do you call it? We call it pyeonggokjeom in Korean. And the concavity changes into convexity. From this point, the specific heat is becoming positive. So beyond the critical mass, the temperature grows as a function of energy, right? So the black holes in antidistal space has two characteristic branches. One, the small black hole branch, another, the large black hole branch with negative and positive specific heat. The qualitative features is easy to understand. Small black holes are qualitatively like the familiar black holes in the sky, in the asymptotically flat, let's say. I don't know whether our world is asymptotically flat or curved, but the black hole in our sky is small enough so that it's not really sensitive to how our universe is curved. So it's really similar to the black holes in our sky. Its thermodynamic behaviors are, however, more exotic, negative specific heat and fast growth of entropy, blah, blah. The large black hole branch is the black hole which fills the box. So it's more, uh, it's more exotic black hole from uh, what we are used to compared to what we are used to, but it exhibits more ordinary thermodynamics, let's say having positive specific heat. And it will turn out that this large black hole exhibiting ordinary thermodynamics will dictate the phase of the system at high temperature. It will provide us a key to understand the high temperature exotic states of this quantum gravity system, okay? If you fix the temperature and describe the system, a state with negative specific heat has no way to enter, right? So this is out of the game from now, but this large black hole will turn out to dictate the physics at high temperature, okay? This is the way that quantum gravity at fixed temperature will be well formulated because you have put it in a finite box, okay? I hope this is partly understand Professor Kisok Kim's question. He was asking me, you know, we, we, I, I never provided to you a full formulation yet, but, 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 you know, there's a natural state containing black holes, which can describe this high temperature thermodynamics with positive specific heat, okay? Anyway, we know these uh, black I, holes- Can I ask you one question? So. Please. Uh, you explain the features of, for the small black hole, large black hole, but uh, does that uh, 
uh, apply only to ADS black hole or other uh, other space time black hole? Um, small black holes will be quite universal because it's not yet filling the space time it is sitting at, right? <laughs> You know, mm, right. basically, the, if it's really small, it's basically the same as asymptotically black, black hole, then it's quite insensitive. Large black hole is more certainly. It's filling the box. It's knowing that the box is taking the ADS shape. So in more, in, let's say, so in other extreme situations, let's say the box can be taking various different shapes. Let's say, let's suppose that our universe is spatially closed, but expands. In the early mm. universe, you know, if the volume is compact, It'll be very hard. It'll be a different way of putting the gravitational system in a box. You can ask whether putting it in ADS and putting it in this is cosmological box is the same. I, I believe the details should be definitely different. I believe. Okay. The hope is that general lessons, it might be possible to draw general lessons out of this model and try to apply certain aspects to more general cases, but I don't really know. Yeah. Thank you. I think the conservative way of saying that is Large black hole branch is very sensitive to the ADS shape of the box. Nice. Yeah, yeah. And the other generality is just a hope. Okay. Anyway, thank you for the question. So having these situations with black holes in mind, let's just imagine going back to 25 years ago when this holographic displacement arise, what could be the fate of this thermodynamics in this ADS CFT models? I explained to you that, so it's this is the cartoon of ADS CFT. Lots of interesting physics can, gravitational physics can happen in the ball. They can be black hole, they can be hot gravitational objects. At the boundary, there should be an image in quantum field theory or gauge theory. I explained to you that the boundary theory for simple models is given by quarks and gluons. And these quarks and gluons are known in general to be in different phases, depending on what the temperature is. Uh, in a way, that's similar to QCD, what we see, that we see in, 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 in the particle colliders. I mean, the gauge theory that we consider now in the context of holography are somewhat different, but the universal features are common to each other. Especially the aspect that I'm going to explain now is common between the gauge theory we are describe, considering now and the gauge theory that describes uh, strong interactions. So the physics of the system of quarks and gluons Suppose at low temperature to be in a confined phase. We know that the quarks and gluons cannot be seen barely at low temperature, and they are only seen in the terms of hadrons like protons, UUD, neutrons, UDD, mesons, uh, U bar, quark, Q bar, Q, blah, blah. They always appear in the singlets of the SU and gate charges, non abelian and gate charges. So that's the nature of the confined phase, and that's supposed to dictate the low temperature phase of the system. Rather than quarks and gluons, nuclei, nuclei and hadrons are the physical degrees, of, I mean, the physical states. At high temperature, as I briefly explained earlier, the system is supposed to deconfine, meaning that the effective description is provided by the liberated quarks and gluon plasmas. Okay. That's what, for instance, what happens in the heavy ion collider, in particle collider system, whose image is given like this. If you collide a heavy nuclei together, they come temporarily become hot. And the best way of describing them is not in terms of hadrons, but in terms of plasma of liberated quarks and gluons. And the two phases are supposed to undergo a sharp phase transition at certain critical temperature. In the case at hand, in the gauge theory that we have been considering, the only length scale that is given to the system is the radius scale of the antidistant space time, the size of the box. The only way at place that where phase transition can happen is when the temperature is inversely proportional to the size of ADS. Okay. And it's naturally supposed, uh, let's say by Edward Witten, that a confinement deconfinement phase transition should happen in this quantum field theory. Precisely the similar kind of phase transition has been found by Hawking and Page using the solution that I have that they have found uh, uh, for the black holes in antidistant space time. So if you fix the temperature and describe the thermodynamics, as I explained to you, the small black hole branch is completely irrelevant. They are not legal thermal saddle points. But the large black hole saddle points are legal ones. There is another saddle point which can compete with them. It's a phase or state of quantum gravity in which no black holes are formed, but it's dominated by thermal gravitons. Right? 
we just have a phase which is dictated by gravitons, which are holographic duals of mesons. That's one phase without gravity. Another phase is the phase in which a large black hole is thermally nucleated. And these two phases compete. Okay? It turns out that at the low temperature phase, the thermal graviton phase dominates, which is holographically due to the confined phase of the field theory. And after the phase transition, the thermally nucleated black hole phase dominates, which is supposed to be dual, I mean, naturally, to the quark gluon plasma phase of the gauge theory. This is a natural picture that has been suggested by Witten uh, 25 years ago. It's natural, and we'd like to see that in more detail. <laughs> Realizing Witten's picture in quantitative setup is extremely difficult. I didn't explain this point so far because the way, but the, gra the way gravity emerges holographically from the holographic dual field theory is in terms of the strong coupling quantum field theory. Uh, there's a question in chat. No, no, not question. Maybe later. Uh, it's uh, just a small comment. Okay, okay. Okay, <laughs> can we discuss that later then? Okay, I I'll discuss that later then. Yeah. I I I'll not forget your chat. Okay. So the thing is that in order to precisely realize, confirm that the gauge theory undergoes a transition to a quark lone plasma phase, and those quark gluon plasma reproduces the physics of black holes, we need to do a calculation in quantum field theory at strong coupling. That's extremely difficult thing to do. Only very recently, like five years ago, people have carried out, including my group, an, a strong coupling calculation of gauge theory in some exactly solvable models, supersymmetric quantum field theory and so on. But in a model which precisely avatars uh, all the essential physics that uh, the Hawking, Page, and Witten have been suggesting. And in this exactly solvable model, we, could ex we mean that we could exactly compute a version of thermal partition functions and use it to compute the entropy and so on and see the black hole physics. Okay. We saw precisely black holes holographically from quantum field theory. For instance, uh, in, in this model, a version of thermal partition function was computed at, at high enough temperature and it's, in, it's taking the following complicated form. We don't really have to know, but, but it grows up as a function of temperature. And the coefficient appearing there here is called the central charges. Central charges are roughly for, uh, a quantity which measures the number of degrees of freedom in scaly variant quantum field theory. And it, and it roughly speaking measures the number of gluonic particles in your system. They turn out all to be proportional to n square, the size of this n by n matrix for gluons. So they represent the, uh, the number of species for the gluons. The fact that this free energy is seeing this uh, n square gluonic degrees of freedom is that the system is indeed in the deconfined phase. You know, the confined phase never allows to see individual gluons, but the fact that the high temperature free energy is seeing this n square proportionality constant is that is implying that the free energy is acquiring contribution from n square individual gluons. So it's a strong hint of the fact that the system is in the deconfined phase. There are more rigorous ways of uh, checking that this describes the plasma of quarks and gluons, but this is the first diagnosis. If you look to transform this free energy, you get an entropy where the black hole mass is very, very large, completely filling this large box. And this Legendre transformed result turns out to completely reproduces the area law of black holes entropy. So it really explains that quantitatively that this hot, hot quark gluon plasma at the boundary is explaining, explaining the big black holes in the bulk. Okay. It's really telling us that the gravity itself has to be fundamentally reformulated at high temperature phase, because the degree of freedom that we are used to in the gravity at low temperature are gravitons, which are corresponding to mesons. You know, at high temperature regime, the fact that in the holographic boundary, we have identified the elementary degrees of freedom as quarks and gluons means that the traditional bulk degrees of freedom to describe gravity like gravitons is a wrong variable at high temperature after this phase transition. So the, this quantitative test that we have made makes have a far reaching implications about the high temperature fate of gravity. Except that saying that 
it should be holographically dual to quark gluon plasma. I don't really have very sharp things to say directly in gravity, but you know, there should be a drastic reformulation of gravity with much the less. Question? Yes, please. No. So does this calculation reproduce small black hole regime? Uh, does this calculation what? Reproduce small black hole behavior. Uh, but not, yeah, yeah, but but, but 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 then you should change your conceptual setup because um first of all you have to do a much more elaborate calculation of the free energy at all general temperatures and uh, all general setup. And, but that has been done. The secondly, you should regard temperature as a derived concept. You always have to have in mind that you should fix your energy and temperature is derived from that. In other words, you have to have in mind that you're always in microcanonical ensemble. But doing that similar calculation in microcanonical ensemble, the small black hole entropy is also reproduced. Yeah, but the formula is much more complicated than this. I've only shown you the simplified formula in the asymptotic large charge limit, large Thank energy you. limit. Yeah, but 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 you know, yeah, small black hole in micro canonical ensemble has been quantitatively reproduced from field theory. Yes. Anyway, yeah. This is a comment that I've already given, I mean, by uh, Professor Min Yu Kim's question. You know, I believe this has a deep implication to quantum gravity in other high temperature extreme conditions like very early universe, but I don't really have concrete ideas on how to implement that. Yeah. Question? Yes, please. <laughs> so, so in the last uh, formula that you showed, is it actually going as T square as, or as one by T in the large T regime? Say, say again, please, sorry. So I'm a bit confused by the two by T behavior in the prefactor. Is it actually going as T square or, or one by T? Oh, it's two by T. Oh, this is some leading correction. Um, it's a one. I think it's two by t. Why, 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 why do you? Because it's cubic, right? So uh, overall, it seems naively that it's actually one by t. Oh, so so this is the asymptotically leading. So when t is very large, so log z is proportional to t square, and if you expand this, it provides you a subleading correction. T to the first one over t. I see. I see. Oh, so, so t to the zero and um, up to one over t. Okay, so, so if you expand this, you're going to get this expansion, right? So it's a subleading correction at uh, in one of a high temperature. I see. And yeah. uh, in the basically the central charges that you have the 3C minus 2C, twice A, basically yeah. in hindsight, would I have expected this from the supersymmetric Casimir energy that relates your log of the, the partition function with the index? I mean, in hindsight, should I have actually expected this? You mean the Casimir energy, vacuum energy? Yeah. <laughs> I think it is true that this combination appears in Casimir energy. In hindsight, in foresight, I don't know. I see, I see. You know, okay. if it's like a two-dimensional conformal field theory, the high temperature and low temperature behavior are related by modular transform. Mm -hmm. Let's say in two-dimensional CFT, it is expected in hindsight that Casimir energy should be related to this Cardi formula of the high temperature free energy. That's right. In these higher dimensional partition functions, people are trying to establish that. I, I think this Casimir energy part has been explored by Hichal Kim, the Professor Hichal Kim a lot. But the connection between the high and small temperature region, that's, I think it's unclear to date. I see. It's an okay. interesting question, which is never clarified completely, I think. I see, I see. Okay, thank you. But... If you compute things and see, I mean, if you compute the free energy and compare it to Casimir energy, its forms are, their forms are similar. Functional forms are similar. So there should be some hidden stories, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one and a half hour is almost, um, so yeah. So this is basically the essential story I wanted to tell you. This, is, this, this makes a one complete story and it emphasizes the main lesson I wanted to draw in this talk. Uh, the remaining two or three slides are just follow up works that I'm doing and it's just advertising what I'm doing. So I'll just be brief to explain to you what these further developments are. So I explained to you that the entropy of these black holes can be studied microscopically in holographic setup. I mean, we've got a lot of lessons like the fate of quantum gravity at high temperature and so on. But the thing is that much more lesson can be hopefully obtained if you can construct the individual states which account for this entropy of black holes. You know, a given entropy is obtained 
by counting a lot of states at given charges and so on. There are lots and lots of states, but if you can actually construct the physical states in any form, it will be really, really helpful to better understand the inner information of black hole. So with this grand motivation, we have been trying to so-called construct the quantum state corresponding to black holes in the gauge theory duel, which is a horribly complicated job. So in a sense, we are trying to do that. Hopefully when the gauge group size is large so that semi-classical gravity emerges, but that's very difficult. At large enough then, I mean, we are constructing gauge invariant operators whose action on the vacuum will provide the desired states. So these gauge invariant operators are creation operators of the states of our interest. But in general N, all the states that we know uh, with gravity dual known, it are these uh, are these uh, the meson-like operators in uh, uh, which are dual to the gravitons. We basically want to construct qualitatively new operators, which hopefully are legal candidates to the black hole microstates. It's hard to do that in large end directly. So we modestly do it in some models. I mean, I say most symmetric young mills theory. It's called maximally supersymmetric young mills in four dimensions. But anyway, in this model with precise gravity dual, we became even modest. And rather considering the larger gauge theory, we consider the gauge theory with low rank, small number of gluons. I mean, we cannot hope to get quantitative lessons, but maybe qualitative lessons we can get. But even in these models, we get extremely novel new kinds of operators which have nothing to do with these gravitons. For SU2 theory, we have constructed an infinite class of new operators, which, which we hope to be an avatar of a black hole in this uh, finite and gauge theory. In SU3 theory, we got a finite number of new operators, but it's much more complicated and it's work in progress. Even these simple operators exhibit various interesting behaviors. I mean, like, I explained to you that the black holes are exhibiting the no hair theorem, which means that outside their event horizon, they don't want to be dressed by graviton matters, right? Surprisingly, these simple operators exhibit these behaviors. If you try to multiply these graviton operators to these new operators constructed, the operator product becomes zero in certain sense. So it really means that certain states, black holes dressed by gravitons doesn't exist. And it also says, that these operators really are poor, dislike to be dressed by gravitons, sort of real, realizing the no-hair theorem in a certain sense. So this is some one work in progress. There's another work in progress. Uh, th 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 there's another work that I'm trying to working on nowadays, trying to use this ADS-CFT to Chan explore. Chan yes, please. A naive question. In the previous page, how do you know that this complicated operator forms of black hole state? Oh, the one that I wrote down here. Yes. Oh, I mean, nobody knows. And actually the question is void because it's, you know, at, you know, you know, when once you're given the gauge group rank, one over N square is giving you the Newton constant. So in order to trust your results from semi-classical gravity, Newton constant has to be small in ADS radius scale. But you know, in this SU2 theory, Newton constant is just one over one quarter in ADS scale. So it's a wildly quantum gravity. So you never know what black hole means in this wildly quantum gravity because all that you have available are semi-classical solutions. So we don't know, it's just hope. I mean, you know, since we found some new objects which are not gravitons, I mean, I we, said, we, we think of the possibility that at least qualitatively in wildly quantum gravity, it may behave somewhat similar to black holes. And, uh, you know, and I'm just showing the phenomenon that it, you know, by showing this no hair behavior of these operators, you know, they sort of behave similarly to black holes in certain aspects. I mean, that's just an observation. I see. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, nobody knows whether it has to do with black hole or not yet. Yes. Yeah. And it's even an ill-defined question because it's strongly coupled quantum gravity in which we have no independent way of addressing black holes. The hope is that these may be addressing, they, these may this might be the definition of the quantum black hole microstates. I mean, but this is my hope, yeah. Yeah, so the next two slides were I pre 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 prepared just to explain the fact that the black holes are also telling a lot about the quantum states of matter holographically. 
in, in particular violating the celebrated no hair theorem in a curious way but i think i i think i can safely skip this part and uh, uh, and, and 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 finish with a conclusion so the concluding summary is that we can learn a lot of lessons about quantum gravity and related topics by studying the thermodynamic properties of black holes the lesson one is about quantum gravity the first half of my talk it's that black hole entropy grows fast and suggests an exotic structure of Hilbert space of quantum gravity having large number of states. And it really explains why, it's, why quantum gravity has to be more delicate than naive particle physics quantization of general relativity, because we have to host a lot of degrees of freedom at, in the UV. And in my mind, in my modern mind, this is what makes string theory a very natural discre candidate description of quantum gravity that we know. The second lesson is also about quantum gravity, but in more extreme phases. So even at, at even higher energy, the study of black holes in well-defined ADS setting has told us that quantum gravity should undergo a phase transition in which all objects in traditional low temperature descriptions of gravity, like gravitons, strings, and brains, and so on, lose their meaning. And instead, this quantum gravity in this regime should be described by what should be the gravity duals of the quarks and gluons in holography. Some people call it string bits, in, in, in that the fundamental string has to be broken up into small bits in high, high temperature, but yeah, it's good. That's the second lesson we got. Lesson three was about the novel states of matter, but I, got, I was skipping it. So uh, sorry for going over time. Let me finish now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the wonderful talk, Professor Kim. Yeah. Any question? Uh, one question. So uh, yeah. you already explained that point uh, you, uh, for the no hair theorem in that black hole operator. The, yeah. the yeah. black hole operator times uh, graviton vanishes. The, can you explain a little more just? Yeah, the thing is that you know, the, many technical details are omitted. So I, I was considering this maximally supersymmetric Young Mills theory, and I was considering states or operators preserving these symmetries. So these operators preserving this supersymmetry can be formulated in cohomology problem. So, so basically the equation of motion for these operators is that these operators have to be commuting with certain supercharge or anti-commuting right. with supercharge. Let, let me just say that a supercharge acting on this operator is zero. But the fact that we are using a cohomology problem, uh, the, the fact that we can use a cohomology problem to address these questions is that the physical operator in this sector should be identified when the two operators related by, uh, by adding certain two exact expressions, okay? So the any operators related by two are identified meaning that any operator which is Q exact is a trivial state, non-existing state. Right. So what ha I have been telling, saying here is that if you try to multiply this graviton and multiply it with, let's say, O0 and multiply this graviton state, apparently they seem to be providing new state, but using lots of uh, structures of this finite end matrices, you can show that it's Q over some other matrix, meaning that it's trivial in cohomological setting. So mm -hmm. it means that in the sector of my interest, the product state doesn't exist. That's the way we show uh, this no hair behavior. Yes, uh, that's so very it's... interesting. Thank yeah, you. So it's... Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, any other question? It... Yeah. yeah, I have a small question. Uh, so in this uh, black hole state, I usually black hole state maybe consists of pure gravitational degree of freedom and some better degree of freedom. Uh, this uh, black hole state uh, can distinguish this uh, uh, gravitational degree of freedom and the matter degree of freedom? Well, it's... Uh, well, it's... Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's uh, the right way of distinguishing it into gravity and matter. But yeah, if you like, well... I mean, because the, in, if we just look at the gravitational uh, theory, uh, pure gravitational mode is coming from bile, uh, bile tensor, and then uh, matter degree of freedom is related to the uh, Lich tensor part. So somehow, uh, and their cohomology is, uh, I think, the different. 
So somehow this uh, uh, black hole uh, cohomology is somehow distinguished uh, these uh, two sectors in some way. That is my uh, question. Uh, well, well, I think I think the way should, we should view this. Um, mm. Well, I mean the right description of the right description of the matter consisting mm. black hole. I think should depend on the energy re mass regime of the black hole you're considering. You know, mm -hmm. let's say the black hole. Let, let's say black hole is an anti to space time, so yeah. energy is made dimensionless, and uh, depending on whether this mass of the black hole is much larger than the number of gluons or much smaller than it, mm -hmm. but of course much higher than the low energy limit, the two effective descriptions should change. I think, in this mm -hmm. very very high energy regime, you know. What I explained to you about this quark gluon plasma, mm. this physics should dominate when the black hole size is extremely big. Mm -hmm. It means that the traditional description of gravity, like gravitons and so on, it becomes completely irrelevant. You know, the gravitons are low energy modes of an oscillating string, but this string itself gets broken up into quarks and gluons in this high temperature phase. Mm -hmm. So in this high temperature phase, I would say that these large, really large black holes uh, should be better described by a completely new high temperature degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if the black hole is not that large, I think it, one can say that this kind of black holes are, are made out of certain traditional matters beyond gravitons. So you, you distinguish see. gravitons and matters. Okay, I see. Yeah. And what, what should be matters should be a lot of exotic states beyond gravitons in quantum gravity, like strings mm -hmm. and D brains and so on, right? Yeah, yeah, reasonable. So yeah. In the energy regime like this, before the system is well described by this quark gluon plasma, in this I mean, not so large energy regime, I think it should be described well by bound states of D brains in anti distance mm -hmm. space. It's mm -hmm. definitely a concept beyond graviton. I see. Yeah. Maybe realizing your concept of what's called matter. Mm -hmm. Okay, it, yeah. Good, yeah. very good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Any other question? Can I ask you one question? So, yeah, is this operator O n related to quark gluon plasma state? It, again, it's very hard to say because, you know, uh, you know, in large n, it will be easy to distinguish it because you know, n square is a large parameter. Depending on whether e is much larger than n square or much smaller than n square, I mean, the effective description is expected to change. So, if energy mm -hmm. is much larger than this. It's better described by quark gluon plasma. And mm -hmm. in this regime, D brain is something like baryons, right? So yeah, yeah. that kind of distinction might be possible. But here, n square is two, and I just is the scale dimension. What was that? Scale dimension is nine over 19, something like 9.5. Mm -hmm. Whether <laughs> this is much larger than n square is four. N square or not, uh -huh. I'm not really sure. So it's a it's, it's okay. very murky situation. I think maybe the distinction between this quark gluon plasma physics and the D brain physics is, is not sharp for finite mm -hmm. end. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But we need to go to large end to clearly address your question, I think. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, and one more question. Do we have any comments about the black holes in Dushita space? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I I try to recall the properties of black. I remember it's really, really exotic. It has two horizons. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, well, I Major better not say Yeah, I, I better <laughs> not say anything. <laughs> OK, OK, thank you. Uh -huh. Any other question? OK, I think we, oh, maybe there is a question. Yeah. Agniva, you have a question? Ah, no, 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 sorry. Okay, okay. Then maybe we have already enough questions. So yeah. let's finish it here. And let's thank uh, speaker Professor Kim again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for- Thank you very much. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Also, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>